Today we're going to take a major block of the book of Leviticus, chapters 18, 19, and 20, and it would take me most of my time that I have to speak just to read those three chapters to you. So in, I'm going to ask you as the message proceeds to simply leave your Bible open to those three chapters. I am going to read uh, some selected verses from each of the chapters which give the underlying principles to the chapter. And let me start by reading chapter 18, verses 1 through 5 of Leviticus, and chapter 19, 1, and uh, chapter 20, verse 7. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and laws, for the man who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. 19.1 The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And chapter 20, verse 7 Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. These chapters are at the beginning of the fourth major section of the book of Leviticus, chapters 1 through 7, the laws of offerings, 8 through 10, the law of the priesthood, 11 through 16, laws of purification, and chapter 17 through the end of the book, laws of purification or holiness, guidelines for practical living. And we might just uh, put in focus a moment what is happening in these three chapters before we look specifically at the content of each. Leviticus 18, after the Verses of principle that I have read, verses 1 through 5, mainly deals with prohibited sexual relationships. And there are at least uh, five categories of prohibited sexual relationships in chapter 18. Prohibited sexual relationships within family, verses 6 through 18, laws of incest. Within marriage, verse 19. Outside of marriage, verse 20. Homosexuality, verse 22 and sex with animals, verse 23. Leviticus 18 also has one brief verse that forbids the Israelis to offer children in sacrifice to the god Moloch, chapter 18, verse 21. And by the way, that's a fascinating verse because periodically you'll hear the question arise as to whether or not uh, the Lord would allow an infant to go to hell or do infants go to heaven. Everybody, I think, has that question that takes the doctrines of heaven and hell seriously. And one answer to that is if in the Old Testament God told his people that they couldn't offer their children to the, in fire to the god Moloch, it would, it would be inconceivable that the God who forbade the Israelites to offer children in fire would at the, at the same time turn around and have children uh, given to an eternal fire. It's logically inconsistent. So Leviticus 18 deals with prohibited, basically deals with prohibited sexual relationships. Leviticus 20 deals with the punishments that uh, apply to the violations that are described in Leviticus 18. In other words, Leviticus 20 matches Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18 spells out what is wrong. Leviticus 20 spells out the punishments, by and large, uh, for all the things that are wrong in Leviticus 18. And then, in, uh, in Leviticus 19, you have some regulations that have to do with our relationship to God and our relationship to our neighbors. In fact, there are 32 specific regulations in Leviticus 19 that apply to our relationship with God and our love for our neighbor. I've called these three chapters, though, living under the authority of God, for that's exactly what is the focus of this part of God's Word. Uh, and it's not only a part of God's word that came to the uh, Israelis uh, 3,400 years ago, but it's a part of God's word that comes to us as well today. And I've taken these three chapters and really divided them into three major headings of how we live under the authority of God as we take these chapters. The first theme is living under the authority of God in sexual relationships. And there are two things, basically, that I want to speak of in this section, incest and homosexuality, which are the focus, really, of, of chapter 18. In regard to incest, in verses 6 through 18, there are 11 different family relationships where sexual relationships are forbidden. 
A man with his mother, stepmother, sister or half-sister, stepsister, granddaughter, aunt, aunt by marriage, daughter-in-law, sister-in-law, stepdaughter, and step-granddaughter. The prohibition of the father-daughter relationship is not mentioned, but it is assumed by all Mideastern cultures, and most likely the prohibitions that are in verses 6 to 18 were prohibitions that were violated both in Egypt and in Canaan, and is why they are prohibited here. Whereas the father-daughter relationship was prohibited both in Egypt and in Canaan, and therefore is not mentioned, although it, that relationship is specifically condemned in Genesis chapter 19. It's interesting, when you look at Egypt, out of which the children of Israel were coming, the whole uh, Pharaoh family was, a, was a, a kind of a story. It would have made a soap opera for, the, for American media today. It was a story of family incest and family relationships throughout the royal family of, of Egypt. God here in these verses is expressing his attitude toward incest. And, and as I read these verses, uh, again, I realized that in going through a, uh, systematically through Scripture, I come across themes that I wouldn't normally choose to speak on. And one of the things that uh, going through the Scripture systematically forces the congregation to do is that it forces us all to encounter all of God's Word because there are parts of it, frankly, that we would just rather leave alone. And some would even raise the question as to whether the pulpit is an appropriate place to talk about incest anyway. I think it's appropriate to speak of it because God does in His Word. And there are most likely persons in this audience that are victims of incest. I know in terms of my own counseling, I find... That, uh, that as the years have gone by, the, the incidence of incest seem to be increasing in terms of the counseling that I do. In fact, uh, nationally, and perhaps this is worldwide, but at least in America, the frequency of in incest is increasing at an alarming rate. Doctors Blair and Rita Justice in their 1979 book, The Broken Taboo, Sex in the Family, note that the estimate for incidence of incest in the United States has grown from one in one million in 1940 to one case in a hundred in 1950, to one person out of 20 in 1970 that would be involved in incest. The National Center on Child Abuse and Neglect estimates that 100,000 cases of sexual abuse within family occur every year, and other authorities consider 250,000 cases to be a conservative estimate. Some researchers are saying that between 5 to 15 percent of the population is involved in incest. It is a, becoming a serious plague on the American scene. R.E.L. Masters, in his book, Patterns of Incest, says, Of all the arguments to be presented against incest, this one seems the most forceful. The family would be disrupted and in some cases destroyed were its members permitted sexual access to one another. Sexual rivalries with consequent hatreds would spring up in some cases. Incentives to exploitation would be maximal. Deterrence minimal. Roles within the family would be confused and discipline would be difficult or impossible to impose. The always precarious harmony of the family unit would not survive the tension. There's a modern psychiatrist saying what the scriptures have said in chapter 18, verses 6 through 20. What should be done in regard to incest? I think as a church body, we need to pray that we as a church family can minister to the victims of incest to persons who have been hurt and perhaps the most damaging emotional uh, thing that a person could ever go through. Louise Armstrong, uh, a secular author, writes a book called Kiss Daddy Goodnight. She is herself a victim of incest. And she gives account after account of incest victims. And the common trait through the book was the hopelessness of ever making a full emotional recovery. There was a tremendous presence of anger and depression. As I closed the book, I thought to myself, if the gospel, if this girl could only know the gospel of Jesus Christ and know the healing power of Christ. Because no matter how deep the loss and how deep the experience that may have been a trauma in our life, we believe that when Jesus Christ has come, he has come to announce good news to the captive and he's come to set the prisoner free. And we believe as Christians that no matter how a person has been victimized in their past life and in, even in their family experience, that Jesus Christ can break the psychological and emotional chains that imprison that person in anger and depression and set them free. And one of the things that we as a church family need to be sensitive about and many times will not even be aware 
that we are, have, a, have, a, have, a, have an opportunity to minister to someone that, is, that has a deep hurt in life, but we need to be aware as we gather and as the Holy Spirit is present among us that He is constantly here to, to heal and to bind up the brokenhearted and to set prisoners free. And as a church, we ought to pray and ask for God to give us a special ministry and sensitivity to those who have been hurt in the deepest areas of life, including the area of incest. I think we also ought to realize as Christians that this can happen in the Christian community. It happened in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 5, a man was living with his father's wife. And Paul tells the church how to deal with it. He says we're not to be silent about it. He says we're to put responsibility on the wrongdoer. One of the facets of incest is that many times blame is put on the wrong person, the innocent, or the wife or the child, when it really belongs on the wrongdoer. He puts the blame on the wrongdoer. He demands that a change be made. And then he insists that grace can be gained through repentance, if there is repentance. Well, the second uh, area of troubled sexuality in Leviticus 18 that I'll just note briefly is the area of homosexuality. Chapter 18, verse 22. Do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman that is abominable or detestable. And again, chapter 20, verse 13. If a man lies uh, with a man as one lies with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They must be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. One may ask, does a look at a scripture like this and the current secular theme is why in the world is God in the bedroom anyway? Why isn't it possible that in our day, one between two consenting adults, anything is permissible? The reason why God is involved in our intimate personal life is that he created us in his image. The scripture says, God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them. That is, maleness and femaleness together equals man created in the image of God. There's a whole series on sexuality on Sunday nights where we went into this at depth. Homosexuality is not fitting anatomically or theologically. It's not fitting because it breaks the image that God has made, that man and woman together equals man in God's image. Man plus man or male plus male cannot equal the image of God. It's male and female together equaling the image of God. And therefore, this union is a distortion of the character and nature of God. And God is telling his people that sexual morality is to mark them off from their neighbors. It's to mark them off as God's people. In fact, 24 times in chapters 18, 19, and 20, God says, I am the Lord, or I am your God. 24 times he spells this out, saying that by this bondedness to his people, they have a special identity with him, and therefore they are not to adopt the ways of the world or the ways of others. To speak out against homosexuality is very unpopular today. I clipped out a cartoon some time ago, Conrad in the LA Times, had four frames in his cartoon. The first frame was a cross. The second frame, he had the cross slightly leaning so that uh, it, uh, it just was leaning. The third frame, the cross had become an X so that it was totally leaning and, and all the sides were equal. The fourth frame, the X had, be, had protruded ends so that it was a swastika. And uh, as you look, as you take one look at the cartoon, you see in four frames the cross going all the way to a swastika. And his uh, line under it was, Today, San Francisco's homosexuals, tomorrow, dot, 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 underneath it, moral majority. And his whole implication was that, the, that those who speak out against homosexuality in our culture are to, uh, to be identified with Nazis who are interested in seeking people out and, and, uh, and doing the kinds of things to people that Nazis did to people. And, and uh, many times those who speak on the subject of homosexuality are so vilified and uh, false logic is used to... Uh, to uh, assail them. Yet the reason why a Christian and why a minister must speak out on homosexuality is that there is no hope for the homosexual unless the homosexual repents. The same as there is no hope for an adulterer, there is no hope for a liar, there is no hope for anyone who continues to insist on remaining in sin and still have God. Repentance must be necessary. And the claim is being increasingly made today that homosexuality is an orientation that is natural. To put Ann Landers, uh, uh, God made left and right-handed people just as he made homosexuals and heterosexuals. So if God is making left and right-handed people and if he is making heterosexuals and homosexuals, then we're to accept any kind of uh, pattern of lifestyle as being from God. Troy Perry, the leader of the Metropolitan Community Church, takes, which is a homosexual community, takes the view toward teaching against homosexuality in Leviticus 18 and 20 as culturally irrelevant. In fact, if you hear Troy, Troy Hamilton or read him as I, or Troy Perry as I have done, he will just totally decimate Leviticus 18 
uh, in his teaching against homosexuality from this point, because he will say, well, how can you take these verses seriously? After all, if you look over to chapter 19, verses 19, you'll find that that same passage which has to do with laws tell us not to make two different kinds of animals, not to plant two different kinds of seed, and not to wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. So my wool and polyester suit is a prohibition of God's law, just like uh, homosexuality is a prohibition of God's law. Obviously, it's okay now to crossbreed animals. Obviously, it's okay to wear clothes that are made of two different kinds of material. Obviously, it's okay to use hybrid seed. Therefore, the whole thing is out the window. That would be Troy Perry's argument. And if you come across any teaching by the homosexual community that is attempting to keep Christian roots, you will basically have that kind of line of approach to Leviticus 18. The response to that line of approach is this. First of all, the New Testament determines what applies to all people and all cultures versus those things which specifically apply to Israel. Whenever you find anything in the Old Testament that is reinforced in the New Testament, then the New Testament is lifting it out of the narrow cultural mold of Israel and bringing it into the cross-cultural code of the world. There are a number of things such as... uh, hybrid seed and and woven clothes and the like that are not spoken of in the New Testament. Therefore, we understand that Christ did not, as a universal principle, establish that, that that principle was given for a limited time to teach a lesson to the people of Israel in regard to the holiness or separateness of God. But when in the New Testament you find a moral principle that is repeated, that is found in the Old Testament, you have an enduring principle that applies to all people of all times. Troy Perry would also say, well, what about uh, Leviticus 20, which demands that for homosexuality as well as other sexual crimes, people be put to death? Or, you know, and this is a, a kind of thing that's raised. Well, are you, you asking for people that have violated things to be put to death? And the response again is from the New Testament, we are taught that we are no longer the state, that the church is totally divorced from the aspect of punishment in society. That in the Old Testament, God's people were both a religious faith as well as a state, a theocracy. But in the New Testament, we are a believing community and we leave laws and the enforcement of laws to the state. We may lobby for laws, but the punishment is not passed out by the church, it's passed out by the state. So all the laws of punishment in Leviticus 20 don't really apply here and now. That's up to the state to determine, and a Christian submits to the state. I think, though, the coup de grace to Troy Perry's view is that of the 32 regulations in Leviticus 19, only... 11 of the 32 are not a part of New Testament teaching. 21 of them are. And surely, Troy Perry wouldn't want to do away with statements like, don't steal, don't lie, don't abuse the handicapped, don't pervert justice, don't endanger your neighbor's life, don't hate your brother, don't make your daughter a prostitute. In other words, Troy Perry will look and he'll point to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 19, and he'll say, Aha, you know, we don't keep that, so why keep this? But what he doesn't do is point to all the scriptures in Leviticus 19 that that everyone would want to insist on keeping. Don't steal, don't lie, don't deceive one another. Don't curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear the Lord, I am your God. Any of you for putting a stumbling block in front of the blind so that they trip as they walk along? Any of you for doing that? I don't think so. So what what you have is a very selective use of the scripture. Our society is getting so so permissive that the only taboo almost left, the only uh, uh, moral norm that is left is uh, is the uh, insistence that cannibalism is wrong. That's about the only thing that's left. And uh, and even some of the the movies coming out lately are, are, uh, are edging toward that. What we are saying as we look at scripture is that the reason why God condemns the activity is that it does not model his image. And whatever doesn't model his image, he wants to correct because he knows that we can never truly be inwardly whole unless we are modeling his image in us. The cure for homosexuality is really to assume personal responsibility. Homosexuality is not genetics. It's not God. It's not my mother or my father made me that way, although there could have been family influences that had a great part. In the last analysis, a person, if he's to ever come out of homosexuality, must admit that at some point along the line, they had a participatory choice in it. They had a choice to get in, even though maybe the cultural and environmental and family factors would seem almost overbearing. If there is a choice somehow to get in, there is a choice that can be made to get out. And we must, I think, as Christians, insist in our day that homosexuality is not something that's left-handed or right-handed. 
But it is. But that that is one of the great lies that the enemy is putting upon our day to tell people that they have to remain hopelessly locked in to deviant sexual behavior. I think the second thing that goes with that is is the case with all sin is repentance, and it is involved in asking the question: Do you want to be whole? And if we can respond, yes, Lord, I want to be whole, God is free to begin working in our life. Another step is responsible counseling by competent Christians. And another is a loving and supportive body of Christ. I think that's the kind of body that the Corinthian church had. Even though they had a lot of problems, there were a lot of people in that church who came from incredible sorts of background, among them male prostitutes, homosexuals, idolaters, robbers, thieves, and the like. And yet they found in the body of Jesus Christ loving acceptance. Not the loving acceptance which is permissive and says anything goes, but the loving acceptance that realizes when a person is wanting to make changes in their life, that God is there with His grace, and we as God's people are there with grace as well to minister and to help. Lewis Goldberg, in his little commentary on Leviticus 18, wraps it all up when he says, What our society must ultimately learn is that permissiveness has its price tag. Broken health, broken spirits, or severe psychological disturbances unwanted children, family crisis, and perhaps a frightful loss of life in abortion. We will learn the hard way that God has woven his absolute standards into the fabric of the world of men. God never intended these laws to be harsh. Rather, the Lord wanted man, his highest creation, to enjoy life, family, children, and society in ways that bring joy to the heart rather than grief or sorrow. Therefore, God cared for his people Israel and wanted to create an island of godliness and desirable morality in the Middle East that would attract the pagan to something better than they had. Living under the authority of God in sexual relationships. The second major category in these three chapters is living under the authority of God in loyalty to Him. Some of these principles are principles that Jesus lifts out and makes them universal. Some of them fall by the way because they only are taught for Israel in the Old Testament. And you can pretty much determine as you go through them which were related to Israel for a time being and which are were meant for all time. The second commandment, 19.4, no idols. The third commandment, no false swearing, 19.12, which simply forbids us not only to take the name of God as an oath, but forbids us to use the name of God as an instrument when making a contract. That's how the name of God would be taken in vain in the Old Testament days. A person would say, I'm going to do this, and to affirm that they would do something, they would say, I affirm in the name of God that I will do it. And if they didn't intend to do that or broke that, they were taking the name of the Lord in vain. The same way when a person today uh, can take the name of the Lord in vain when they pass themselves off as doing business as a Christian. And there are a lot of people in Orange County that do business and use the word Christian in order to get business. And maybe don't do a good job at all, but the, but the name of Christ is getting them money. And if one uses the name of Christ to get work, then one better be better sure that the Lord's name is not being taken in vain. Uh, fourth commandment, the Sabbath. The, in chapter 19, verses 5 and 8, proper use of the peace offering. Of course, we don't have the peace offering anymore, but there's a really neat thing in that little section that says that after the third day, they couldn't eat the meat of the peace offering any longer. And that's significant because the peace offering was the happiest offering. It was the, it was the Thanksgiving offering that would be given where all the family would kind of like sit down and have Thanksgiving together. And the neat thing is that it, it couldn't be taken after the third day. And I think maybe the reason that, was, that it was the principles being established is you can't go on living on past experiences. So don't save your meat week after week, day after day, you know, this kind of thing. But, but have your joyous experience and pass on and get ready for the next experience. Don't cling to the past. There's the avoidance of the occult in verses 26 and 31 about staying away from witches and, and the like. There's uh, absent, uh, absentation from blood, verse 26. That was taught in Leviticus uh, 17. Uh, there is uh, also uh, to abstain from a, uh, identifying with pagan gods. You'll notice verses 27 and 28, some strange regulations. Do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. And do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. The reason why this prohibition was given was that in Canaan, some people had haircuts and beard cuts and tattoos that were marks of honor to pagan gods. Or when a person died, their body was marked in honor of that god. And children of Israel were told not to even have the appearance of loyalty to one of the pagan gods. They would offer first fruits to God in verses 22 through 25. Plant a tree... 
and don't eat of it for five years. And finally, the fifth year, you can, after giving the fourth year to God, the fifth year, you can eat the tree, from the tree. And then uh, the ninth thing was to avoid pagan forms of worship. Verse 29, don't degrade your daughter by making her a prostitute. You might ask, who, what father would do that? A father in Canaan would do it because of the whole association of Canaanite religion with immorality and pre-immoral priestesses. Literal translation is, don't make your girl a holy girl, is the word that is involved here. The third area of living under authority in these three chapters is living under the authority of God in love for our neighbor. The key principle from the heart of the Old Testament is chapter 19, verse 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Words that our Lord himself quotes. It's interesting that we are told to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves. Never are we told to love God as we love ourselves. We are told to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, but we are not told God told told to love God as we love ourselves. And the reason is is that we are to have a if you can believe this a greater love for God than we have for ourselves. And we're not to limit our love for God by self love, but we're to have a love for God that gets beyond self love. That's why Jesus teaches in Mark eight. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. If I love myself, I'm trying to fulfill myself, not deny myself. And if I love myself, I'm trying to save my life, not lose it. But Jesus says our love for God goes beyond love for neighbor. In talking about love for neighbor, there is... uh, There are a number of sub-principles under this in chapters 19 and 20. There are duties of parents, not to make a daughter a harlot, not to give children to Moloch, the god Moloch, chapter 20, verse 4. You might just uh, look at that and think it's rather strange that any parent, any normal, natural parent, would ever offer their child to a god a fire, to, to lay that child at a heathen altar and let that child be burned up before their eyes. What kind of a parent would put their child to the fire? Why would they do that? The reason why they did it is because they believed that if they gave their child to the fi- in the fire to Moloch, then Moloch would increase their crops and give them greater prosperity. By offering their child, they would have greater prosperity. Now I ask you, has that principle died off? Do people still offer up their children in order to secure more personal prosperity? How about being so busy that we shunt our children aside? pushing our own children so hard to satisfy our own ego, making them adults before they're ready, sacrificing them to the TV god Moloch so we can be more free to do our things. Any application? Are the people that offer their children to Moloch really all that strange? We just have a slower form of death in our culture. Duties of children. Revere and respect their parents, 19.3. And do not curse their parents, Chapter 20, verse 9. No matter what kind of parents their parents have been, don't curse them. And I think really this is the key to healing where a person has been badly violated or hurt as a child. A key in getting in dealing with the anger and the resentment is to, is to ask the Lord to bring a forgiving heart and a forgiving mentality. Other areas of relationship, business life, pay wages. Good thing like paying wages. Don't you like that verse? Uh, Don't hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Chapter 19, verse 13. Why don't hold his wages back overnight? Well, because in those days a person worked on a day-to-day income. And if he works today, then at the end of the day he ought to get paid. And if he doesn't get paid, then he'll go home that night and he won't have anything to feed his family. So don't hold his wages back overnight. Pay your pay your when you're you know, pay your bills on time is basically what this is saying. Pay your employees on time, if you have employees. And uh, if you are an employee here and your employer is not paying you on time, take this verse to them and say, my pastor said to bring you this verse. (laughs) Business life, honest scales. I think, by the way, just back on on paying things, I, I really think that one of the things involved as God is judge is that there is a whole lot of defrauding that goes on in this world. People defrauding people out of money. People that turn deals and cut deals, oblivious to the personal welfare or the family welfare of a person, and just to make the almighty dollar, they'll do anything to make it, no matter who they have to trample on. 
One of our beliefs as Christians is that we, we know that there will be a day of judgment when God will make a person realize the consequences of what they've done. And, and as Christians, we're not saying, oh boy, just wait, God will get you in the judgment. Wham! You know, uh, We keep our own hearts right in that perspective, but we recognize that God will hold us all accountable and that evil will not go continually unchecked. In business life, persons were told to have honest scales, verses 35 through 36, so that they didn't uh, weigh things out in a, in a different proportion to what they really were. Life in society at large, financial honesty, verbal honesty, caring for the handicapped, integrity. Verse 15 of chapter 19 says, don't show partiality to the poor because they're poor. When it comes to the court of justice, just because the person is poor, don't, don't throw the case his way. And on the other hand, don't show deference to the great. Don't say, well, just because they've got a name and a title and a lot of money or a big position, don't show deference to them, but have equal justice for all. California State Supreme Court might well hear that. Amicable neighborly relationships. Chapter 16 through 18, we're not to endanger one another's lives. No hatred, rebuking when necessary, not carrying revenges. Verses 20 through 22, regarding persons, not as property, but as persons. Respect for the aged, verse 32. And incredibly, verses 33 through 34 are a thing that really applies to Southern California. When an alien lives... Well, let me read this as it would read. When someone from Mexico lives with you in your land of Southern California, or when someone from Vietnam, or when someone from Cambodia lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him or her. This person living with you must be treated as one of your native-born citizens. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Right treatment of aliens. How many of us, when we look at our own hearts, sometimes toward aliens, and the feeling, well, they don't belong here, you know. And, and, and yet, realizing the scripture, that we are to love all persons, including persons who, quote, don't belong here, end quote. Oh, really demanding scripture, isn't it? Love for neighbor. Well, there's a whole lot of regulation, as you can see, in these three chapters. And I want to kind of bring it to a conclusion by saying, what is it that motivates us to behavior that lives under the authority of God? And there is some motivational matter in these chapters that I have read at the start. What motivates us to live under the authority of God? It is this. I am the Lord your God. Therefore, don't be like they were in your past in Egypt and don't be like they're going to be in your future in Canaan. I am the Lord your God. I do things differently. I, I the Lord your God, am holy. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am the Lord your God. Why are the children of Israel to behave as they were to behave? Because that's the way God would behave and they're to be motivated by the way God would live his life out in terms of human flesh. Why do we behave as we do? Why do you behave as you do? If you were to make a list of why you're doing what you're doing, what would you say? I discovered this week that there is a great difference between moving and motivation. Moving is going through the motions. It's doing what is expected. It is performing. Performing even satisfactorily. Whereas motivation is doing something because deep inside of me, I really want to do it. I really want to achieve it. I really want to be this way. To give you an example of the difference between moving or going through the motion and motivation, I'd select my dog, Sunshine, as an example. When he is well, he does a marvelous job of begging. If you hold a little goodie up for him, he's a little apricot French poodle, he will come along and he will stand so prettily on those hind legs and he will do a little ballerina dance and pirouette around and, and for, for proper behavior like that he is rewarded with a tasty little morsel. Now actually, if I didn't do that for sunshine, he has no inward motivation to stand on his hind legs and pirouette. I don't walk, I don't walk into the home after a day and, and come in into the room and there is, there is sunshine off in the little corner by himself practicing his pirouettes. You know, he just never does this. He'd go through all of life without ever standing on his hind legs and doing a pirouette. He, 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 he doesn't have any motivation to do that at all. The only reason why he does it is that something is offered him. 
And because something is offered to him, he goes through the motions. His heart really isn't in it, but he knows that's what that's what this dumb owner wants. So he takes all the pains to go through it in order to get his delicious bite. But he's not really inwardly motivated. He's just going through the motions. And I think uh, when I look at sometimes in my own Christian experience, to ask myself, am I only going through the motions? Or am I inwardly motivated? Am I doing what I'm doing out of fear of reward or punishment? Out of the hope of hell or, or the hope of heaven or the fear of hell? Or am I doing what I'm doing because someone else expects it of me and it's somebody else's opinion and so I'll behave well because other people expect it of me? What the Lord is asking His people to do in these chapters is to go beyond simply moving, going through the motions, but to gain an inward motivation that says, I am the Lord your God. I do this because of God. Has anyone ever been so special to you that you'd, you, you said, I'd do anything for them? There are people like that I know. I would do anything for them. And that's what God is asking us to do in these chapters. And, and that, by the way, is why many people so misread the Mosaic Law. They think the Mosaic Law is just one uh, rule that God's setting down after another without, without ever, uh, you know, just laying a trip on people. But what is laid down is a result of God's loving care and concern for His people it's because he wants them to really live free that he gives his law. And when we too have violated his law and realize we can't keep it, he then goes beyond that to give us his grace. And we're to feel toward God like I do anything for God. To be motivated by our love and our concern for him. What really therefore is to motivate our behavior according to the scripture is not the fear of getting into trouble or the fear of somebody else's opinion or even the fear of eternal loss, but is the love for God which is in our hearts that gets a hold of us and seizes us and says, I'd do anything for God because He has redeemed me. He has brought me from Egypt. He is bringing me to Canaan. I am one of His people. I am on the way and I want to love and respond to Him. The Gospel Chorus says it well, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask to be like Him. Let's look to Him in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today grateful in our hearts that you have made us your own people, your own special people. That we who were outside of your family have been adopted as your sons and your daughters. We realize, Lord, as we listen to the content of a message like this, that we live in a world of confused values, a world where right is no longer right and uh, wrong is right a world that is often upside down in its thinking, a world that is increasingly telling us that morals and responsibilities are not outside of us in some written authoritative law, but they're simply in us and that whatever we feel is the best at a particular given moment is what is right. Lord, because you love us so much, you're telling us that we cannot guide our life dependent upon what we feel like, that you've painted roads, or that you've painted directions on roads down the pathway of life. And you've given us no passing signs. And you've given us avoid danger signs. And you've given us signs with curves. And you've given us slow down signs. And you've given us stop signs. And you've given us green lights too. You've given us speed limits. And all this you've done, Lord, because you love us and because you want to protect us as we travel under your care. So we bring our lives to you, Lord, in these special areas that we mentioned this morning. We would especially pray, Lord, for those persons in here that are going through a difficult time in their own inward emotion because of a previous bad family experience. Maybe a person here that has been a victim of family abuse. And we pray, Lord, that whether that abuse was physical or strictly mental, that you would bring your healing presence and that you would put a a seed of faith in that individual's life now to realize, Lord, that you are the one who has come to, to, to bind up the brokenhearted and to set the captive free. And that you also, Lord, will bind the strong man so that that strong man can no longer hurt or damage them outwardly or inwardly in their heart of hearts. We pray, Lord, for, for all the areas in which 
we may have struggle in our life between right and wrong. And we're tempted even this past week to walk outside of your will and to do something which for the moment would appear to give a lot of satisfaction, but which we know from the long-term consequences is so wrong to you and would be so wrong for us. And we bring ourselves once more to the cross where you died, where your struggle against sin was so intense that you went to death for us to deliver us from the curse of death in our own life. And we, Lord, with our own passions and temptations and struggles in life, struggles with people and emotions and all those kinds of things, would go again to the cross with you and would ask for you to nail to the cross that in us which is unworthy and unlike you and renew our hearts and spirits so that we may know you as the Lord holy in our lives and the Lord who makes us holy. Renew our hearts, O Lord, and truly make us in our inward character your people every day, every minute, loving you, serving you. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.